the greater diversity in the plants that you eat on a weekly basis, the healthier you are. I give people challenges. Can you eat 25 different fruits and vegetables? Can you eat 30? I think it's valid. I think it's so valid because that is how we get all of those different, all of those different phenols and proanthocyanins and all of the phytonutrients that come inside of plants. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below. It's a little red button. You punch that and it's going to notify you every time we put out a new episode that can help you improve your bone health. And then also, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for the free seven day osteoporosis kickstart. That's going to walk you through everything you need to be doing right now to get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. After you do those two things, go ahead and press play on this episode and I'll see you inside. Welcome, welcome to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. Joining us today to explore osteoporosis medications, the microbiome, and so much more about how they impact your bone health is Dr. Lindsay Elmore. Dr. Lindsay Elmore is a speaker, author, podcast host, and world-renowned wellness expert. She translates complicated science into understandable stories and travels the world educating audiences about natural wellness. Dr. Elmore obtained an undergraduate degree in chemistry from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and a doctor in pharmacy from the University of California, San Francisco. She completed her first year postdoctoral residency in pharmacy practice at Princeton Baptist Medical Center in Birmingham, Alabama, and her second year specialty residency in ambulatory care at New Hanover Regional Medical Center in Wilmington, North Carolina. She's a board certified pharmacotherapy specialist and licensed to practice in three states. She's also a certified 250 hour vinyasa, yin, and aroma yoga instructor, and aerobic freedom practitioner, and the creator of the Clean Slate Cleanse. Dr. Elmore has spoken to audiences on five continents, more than 30 countries. Her educational material has been translated into more than 25 languages. She's the author of multiple books, one of which is The Essentials 75 Answers to Common Questions About Essential Oils and Supplements and a Clean Slate Cleanse cookbook and workbook series. She's published a variety of pharmacy and medical journals, been quoted in multiple news publications, and she's also the host of the Lindsay Elmore Show podcast and the founder of lindsayelmore.com. Dr. Lindsay, it is such a pleasure to have you here today. Thanks so much for joining us. I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. No, it's great to have you. So let's dive in and let's even talk about you know, how your, how your journey started to where you are now. I mean, you are a world renowned wellness expert at this point, and you've, uh, you've done so much great work in the field of, of health. And I'd love to just get an understanding of how you even moved from where you started out to where you are now. Well, I think as with many people in this industry, it all starts with our own personal health challenges. And so I realized So in pharmacy school, I tore my ACL. And when you tear your ACL, they lock your leg out straight in a leg brace. And it caused me to have to hike my hip every single time I took a step. And I realized 12 weeks into this, I couldn't sit on my sitting bones anymore because my hips were so far out of alignment. Long story short, that lands me in the chiropractor's office. I tell the chiropractor like, doc, I have not slept in a month. I feel like I'm going to die. She says, go try the acupuncturist. And that opened up a whole new world to me of, oh my gosh, there are so many different ways to look at health, to look at wellness, to look at medicine and what is medical practice. And so I started studying, started learning, kind of became known as a little bit of a weird pharmacist who knew as much about supplements and herbs and weird esoteric treatments for all these kinds of things. I knew as much as I did about drugs and the journey just continued from there where I just kept learning, kept exploring, kept picking up different modalities and seeing what worked for me. And then just really being a constant lifelong learner was the biggest thing that I wanted to do. And you know, I was telling somebody the other day, I was like, gosh, everything basically, except, you know, if, if ever I'm sitting back going like I'm bored, I'm like, no, 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 nothing is boring when I'm learning. And that's kind of how I got to this point. That's awesome. And and being curious, I mean, is one of those drivers for so many health professionals too. And even just people that are on their own health journey, it, um, getting that, that sense of curiosity, instead of just 
oh, you know, I have to go do this other thing. Be curious about it. And that's actually going to open probably more doors for you. And I'm really interested because you have a unique perspective also being a pharmacist and understanding the natural health world. But you're also intimately familiar with osteopenia and osteoporosis medications and also so talk to us about the current western medical treatment for osteopenia and osteoporosis so i ran i saw a lot of patients with osteopenia and osteoporosis um when i was in residency because it was primary you know it was outpatient medicine um versus most of my career was spent inpatient but you know when i think about osteoporosis treatment there's sort of this sliding scale where you kind of start with some calcium, you start with some vitamin D, maybe if you've got somebody who is more attuned and and up to date on literature, maybe you add in a few other minerals or vitamins with it as well. But then most of the time people graduate to what are called the bisphosphonate drugs. And these bisphosphonate drugs contain two huge phosphate atoms. That's why they're the bisphosphonates, right? So bi means two, like in bicycle, phos means phosphorus. So we've got two phosphorus that are sitting on these drugs. And what they do is they stick to the calcium that's in your bones. So they stick to this positively charged calcium and these negatively charged phosphorus. It it works like a magnet. And so these bisphosphonate drugs kind of coat the outside of the bones with this hard protective layer. And so you may see that, you know, we have drugs like Fosamax, uh, Boniva, Actinel, one that's less common is called Reclass. Um, and there are also brand new drugs that are monoclonal antibodies. So any of the drugs that end in the letters MAB, MAB, that means that they're monoclonal antibodies. And monoclonal antibodies are, as far as meds go, they're assertive. They're quite, quite assertive in their mechanism of action and the way that they and the way that they work. But the problem with bisphosphonate medications is that they have a lot of very strange side effects. They have a lot of very strange problems that come along with them. And so These bisphosphonates, I mean, very well known to cause stomach upset, heartburn. You're actually instructed. I hope if any of your listeners are on bisphosphonates, like like abandronate or alendronate or resendronate, any of those meds, that they've been taught you're not supposed to lay down for 30 to 60 minutes after you take one of those medications because they can... They can burn a little bit in the esophagus, but they also just cause so much heartburn when they are refluxed back into the esophagus. And so this is a medication that you want to be up and moving and be sure that it's getting all the way down. And the meds aren't really well absorbed either. And so that's, you know, you got to separate it from food because you've got to give it a, a fighting chance of, of getting into, getting into the stomach. And so what concerns me the most about bisphosphonate meds is that they can cause some very severe side effects. And so, yes, they will make your bones harder, right? But as I'm sure you've talked about a lot, bone health is an very elegant dance of building bone and breaking down old spent bone. And we need that dance to happen. And if we're just like artificially clamming on top this fortress, we're interfering with that. It's the same thing that we see with the fluoridation of water and our teeth. It has become increasingly more difficult for dentists to really diagnose, is this a cavity or not? Because the surface of the tooth is so hard, even if there is decay occurring underneath. So the bisphosphonate drugs, they put this artificial armor on the bones. And what happens is that, let's say a bone breaks, right? Instead of bones following a normal kind of linear jagged pattern of breaking, 
what we tend to see is a torsion, a twist on the bone when you're using bisphosphonate drugs. And so this torsion and this twist actually shatters the whole inside of the bone structure versus breaking, being able to put back to place with the pin. Now you're talking, you're cleaning out bone material. You're trying to piece together something that doesn't quite fit. So bizarre, odd fractures can happen when you're taking the bisphosphonate drugs. The other major side effect, which is, listen, I don't want to scare the, I don't want to scare our listeners, but this isn't uncommon. I'm not saying it's common, but it's not uncommon, but it's certainly something you see in your career is osteonecrosis of the jaw. So the jaw actually starts to break down because I personally think it's because the jaw is required to move constantly. And so it's constantly butting up against this artificial armor that it's tearing through and tearing through. And eventually it's just, there's so much friction, so much inflammation that it causes uh, the breakdown and the death of, of the bone. And so those are the most severe side effects, but they are they're they're not something that you won't see in in your career. And so it's definitely something that we need to keep in mind is if we're going to use bisphosphonate meds, let's at least understand what are the risks and how do we teach people how to mitigate those risks. Yeah, and and I mean especially for uh, one of the greatest concerns I know with bisphosphonates, you pointed out some of the major concerns of uh, of their use, but uh, it's for treating osteoporosis. The, the safety and efficacy of these drugs are is not really known, you know, beyond five years. They're for patients that took them for less than five years. And one of the other major points of concern that you had brought up also is that you're supposed to have this natural remodeling of your bones over time right? You've got osteoclasts that come in and scoop out that old worn damaged, weakened bone. And then you've got these osteoblasts, these bone building cells that come in and fill in that stronger, healthier bone. Uh, but when you're slowing down that the activity level of those cells too much, you're not going to have, it's a coupled process. You're not going to have that, that stronger, healthier bone that's come in, filling in that new, stronger, healthier bone. So you may over time start to accumulate that that old worn damaged weakened bone uh so that's a really really important point i'm glad you brought that up uh there are other medications but i don't uh, um in terms of she, Lindsay was talking dr Lindsay was talking about anti-resorptive specifically bisphosphonates there's also an anti-resorptive called prolia rank yes, those are the monoclonal antibodies that we yep. mentioned yep. yep yep and then also uh there's anabolics that's a whole nother category of drugs and that would be like your forteo your timlos your avenity yep. those kinds of drugs and those, and those drugs, I tell you, I am, I'm actually a fan of some of like the Terry Paratides. I have seen them work really, really well. That's the, that's the Forteo. And I mean, these are peeps who have really, really, really low um, bone density. And I've seen those drugs not only work really well in severe situations, but I've also seen them work really well in people who have metabolic problems that are leading to the bone um, resorption because, you know, bone health in a lot of ways and calcium status and phosphorus status, it's very much governed by the parathyroid. And when the parathyroid is out of whack, we can have major transformations in bone health. And this is a common, very common um, side effect of chronic kidney disease. And so if you're somebody who has, you know, maybe you've been told you've got stage two kidney disease or something like that, you need to go ahead and start focusing on the bone health as well, because when the kidneys are out of balance, calcium and phosphorus status get out of balance, that throws parathyroid hormone out of balance. And then the governance of parathyroid hormone on this flux between the osteoblast and the osteoclast is, is disrupted. And it, it can be very, very detrimental. Yeah. And you, you, touching on kidney health, even just for, I mean, if your kidneys are damaged, you're going to have a hard time reabsorbing calcium also. Um, but one of the other important things that you had mentioned was um, in terms of these anabolic medications 
and their impact on patients that maybe have really poor quality bone, or maybe they've fractured multiple times uh, in a really non-traumatic way. Those are usually the situations when a physician is going to recommend that medication. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. that's typically the, the use for those uh, medications. I, an important thing I do want to mention, though, is regardless of whether someone is taking a medication or not, you still have to do all of the other things. It's not an if or an or uh, kind of thing, which is really important for our audience to understand that as well. So let's talk about um, some of the other pieces here. So are there supplements beyond vitamin D and calcium, which we know are important for bone health, um, but that's going to be the standard recommendation. What else beyond that uh, are, do you like to see in a plan for, you know, supplementing to support bone health? Absolutely. I mean, calcium and vitamin D are kind of like the quintessentials. I will, I will give one quick shout out just on dosing. Please don't take mega doses of calcium. Your body can't absorb it. And all you're doing is causing yourself constipation. Like just don't, you know, 250, 500 milligrams maximum. That's the maximum you can absorb in any one dose. So stop wasting your money. And then when it comes to vitamin D, please ensure that you are taking vitamin D3, not D2. You want to take cholecalciferol, not ergocalciferol. Um, and ergocalciferol, if you are within the Western medical system, you're probably being prescribed ergocalciferol. And we don't want ergocalciferol because vitamin D3 is more closely aligned with our natural vitamin D. And what we see is that even though levels rise um, at the same rate with D2 and D3, they flatten off with D2 and they continue to rise with D3. So we really want to be taking, if we're going to take supplements, let's take them correctly. Right. And then if I think about bigger, um, and, and more supplements, my brain like immediately goes to magnesium. I think the fact, you know, in, in one of my favorite books, the most influential textbook of my entire life is a book called healing with whole foods by Paul Pitchford. And it takes Chinese medicine and applies, uh, it takes Chinese medicine and applies Western eating principles to Chinese medicine. And he writes about in this book, something called the calcium fallacy, how we have been just hammered, 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 that bone health is all about calcium. That's cute because that was simply a marketing campaign from back in the forties that the USDA put together when the industrialization of milk production was coming with greater and greater ease. And we were told milk, it, you know, milk, it does a body good and the milk council and the, and the calcium and the calcium and the bones. And so, but we have to have magnesium to help push the calcium into the bones. So magnesium helps to build the bones, absorb the calcium, form the ATP that goes in to the production of healthy bones. Magnesium is also a cofactor of the production of vitamin D in the skin. And 75% of the population may be deficient in magnesium because when you measure magnesium, serum magnesium levels, you don't see them out of whack that often. You know, they're typically, you know, between two and four and you're like rocking and rolling. But we've also never seen people who like have hypermagnesemia where they're like suffering consequences from too high levels of magnesium. So we know that low magnesium in the blood correlates with low bone density. Um, it also impairs the production of parathyroid hormone. It impairs the production of the most active form of vitamin D, which is the 125 dihydroxy version. You have to have magnesium. And so magnesium is, we, it, you know, it's very deficient in the standard American diet because, you know, we have to get it from dark leafy vegetables, legumes, grains, nuts. There's a few proteins like fish and meat that contain magnesium, but taking a magnesium supplement is not only good for bone health, it's good for your mental health. It's good for your heart health. It's good for your sleep pattern. I mean, just, just, just take the magnesium supplement. Yes. Um, yes. All the magnesium. And, and yeah, I, 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 it's astonishing and extraordinary, honestly, all of the things that magnesium can do. Another, another supplement that's really making some some headway in the past few years, you used to never hear about vitamin K2. But now we hear about vitamin K2 
all of the time. And it's not only essential for bone health, but also cardiovascular health. Um, and elderly patients with osteopenia tend to lack K2. Some experts say that basically everyone in the United States is deficient in K2. Um, in foreign countries, vitamin K2 is one of the first primary treatments for osteoporosis instead of the bisphosphonates. Um, K2 is important because it helps to pull calcium out of the vasculature and deposit it into teeth and bones because calcium in the vasculature is real bad calcium. It's real bad calcium. It's not where you want your calcium to be because what happens when you have calcium in your vasculature, it syncs up with fats, creates what's called atherosclerotic plaques that then begin to calcify on the inside. So now you have bone inside of your arteries. No. It's a hard pass. And so K2 is so good because it can pull out of the vasculature and really helps to prevent it from being deposited. Um, K2, so it's not only good for the bones, but it's also good to reduce the risk of, of coronary heart disease. And K2, it is a fat-soluble vitamin. And so in my estimation, probably better to be getting K2 from a supplement than eating tons of butter, tons of cheese, uh, certainly not eating, you know, I've heard some people say like salami, it's a great source of vitamin K2. And I'm like, it's also a World Health Organization class one carcinogen. So you pick your poison. Um, another one is strontium, which I don't think people think about a lot. So this is an alkaline earth metal that's very similar to calcium and barium. And 99% of the strontium in our body is inside of our bones. And so if we're strontium deficient, we have seen increases in non-vertebral fractures there. Uh, strontium can really help to decrease bone resorption, increase bone formation, increases bone density in both men and women. And it, it, you know, you can even use radioactive strontium by prescription to help treat bone cancer because it's so targeted to the bone. That is where the strontium goes to. And, you know, same thing, boron can really reduce the um, excretion of things like calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus, all really critical for bone. And then even though it's not a supplement, I think it bears mentioning about the hormonal connections between estrogen and bone as well, and the emerging evidence that we have for bioidentical hormones um, for people who aren't sensitive to soy, those isoflavones in soy that can give some phytoestrogens are also very, very important as well. Um, you know, one of the, uh, one of the things you touched on right at the beginning of these, these different nutrients you were talking about is vitamin D. And a lot of times people are, when I talk to people, they're being proposed, maybe these large shots of, or, you know, significant doses of vitamin D and they're considering taking that. But what you're saying is that that's probably not the right way you want to go because, um, it's, it's going to level off pretty quickly. Yeah. I mean, I see, I mean, I, I saw it a thousand times in, in my, in my pharmacy career, you know, people who have chronic kidney disease and they're getting 50,000 international units of ergo calciferol and everybody's scratching their head going like, why is their vitamin D still low? And it's like, you know, there's more to the equation than just mega doses of vitamin D. You know, we have to, we have to be I mean, I feel like one of the greatest breakdowns in modern society when it comes to health is that we've gotten so far away from the way that our ancestors used to live. And so it's not like our ancestors were just like rocking around finding this like vat of vitamin D and ingesting it. They were getting a little bit of vitamin D here, a little bit of magnesium there, a little bit of boron here, a little bit of calcium from here. And it was all kind of coming together. This is this is one of the reasons that I am opposed to mega dose vitamins. Like when I see 
energy shots with like 12,000% of your vitamin B12. I'm just like, no, that's not the way that it's meant to be, especially with vitamin D, which is a fat soluble vitamin, which can bioaccumulate in the tissues. You know, we want to have enough vitamin D, um, but we want to be getting it in a reasonable manner. Sure. Um, and, and that's a great point too, because too much vitamin D can also contribute to bone loss. So that's mm -hmm. something that we absolutely don't want. Uh, and then the other piece was, um, magnesium, super important, completely agree. Uh, most people are not getting enough supplementing with magnesium, super, super important. Uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. strontium also strontium itself, um, is in terms of, you were talking about mega doses of supplements and things like that. There is some, there are some positioning out there uh, for strontium in higher doses. And, you know, I, I see this a lot in marketing that guaranteed to improve bone density and bone strength. And one of the reasons that it, it can guarantee an increase in bone density is that it's a higher molecular weight than calcium. It's going to show up on that DEXA scan as, you know, being more dense. And that's going to, the bone may not actually be stronger and you could end up having a higher result. So when it comes to strontium, I would even just say for people listening to, if you're still actively losing bone and you have some kind of root cause issue or something like that, um, I would, I would strongly consider figuring out those root causes before you even start diving into, um, you know, investigating strontium supplementation as, as a way forward. Uh, but strontium itself, not bad. Uh, you were talking about some great benefits with strontium. It's a natural trace mineral. It's found in, in soil, certain foods, and smaller amounts. Uh, but just keep in mind, when a company says they can guarantee an increase in bone density through supplements, that supplement will usually contain strontium. Um, and then one of the other things uh, that we touched on, which was, um, which was great, um, actually, I wanted to get into some other ways uh, that we can help address bone loss, prevent osteoporosis even. And I'd like to talk about some of the more uncommon ways that you've seen, Dr. Lindsay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure many of your guests have talked exercise and good nutrition and quitting smoking and limiting alcohol. But one of the things that I think doesn't get talked about enough is the correlation between the microbiome and our our bone health. And so the the human microbiome is a collection of bacteria and yeast and fungus and virus and archaea and all of these billions, arguably trillions of bacteria that live on us in us and not just in our gut. I think people think about like, oh yeah, there's bacteria in my gut. No, 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 no. There's bacteria everywhere. It's on us, in us, on every surface that we touch. It's in the environment. And then we, as we have human connections, exchange our microbiome. It is a communication tool that we all use, not even just as humanity, but as the entire everything that's happening in the world, right? Everything, uh, the soil, the trees, the air, everything. So the human microbiome influences a ton of chronic conditions, um, including bone mass and bone quality. Um, and it also, of course, is associated with inflammatory bowel disease, obesity, diabetes, all the things. But not a ton of people have really looked at what's the connection between the microbiome and health. And what I, what I started looking at is like, okay, well, how does the microbiome influence our bone health. And so in medical research, there's this concept of what's called a germ-free mouse, where basically you just take the mouse and you sterilize it, right? So you kill its entire microbiome. It's a sad day for that mouse. It really is. And so what we see is that if you have an absence of a gut microbiome, we see altered bone mass because of pure, uh, excuse me, poor acquisition of bone mass during adolescence, which leads to low bone mass in adulthood, right? So poor acquisition of bone mass, bone mass during our growth leads to us having poor bone mass as we are adults. 
We also know that if we use the microbiome to alter estrogen, right? So if you take a germ-free mouse, the estrogen gets out of balance, and this leads to alterations in circulating sex hormones, which leads to bone loss. We also know that if there is a, a mouse where the microbiome of the ovaries are off, we can also see bone loss there. The, the gut microbiome is absolutely critical for the digestion of food and the production of what are called postbiotics. And postbiotics we're going to circle back to in a moment. But if your gut microbiome is off, guess what? You're not absorbing calcium and magnesium and vitamin K2 and vitamin D and strong. You're not, you're not absorbing any of that from your food. And you're certainly not able to as effectively do the enzymatic transformation steps that it takes to activate some of these, some of these vitamins, right? So if your gut microbiome is not allowing you to digest your food, then you're not getting any of the nutrition that's key for, for bone health. And we also know that the worse off the microbiome is, the more likely you are to have frailty in the elderly. And we see that as, you know, as, as declines in the Barthol index, as well as people's just being able to be functional and independent, right? Um, we also know, so obesity is a protective factor for, arguably, a protective factor for osteoporosis. But we also know that when people are overweight or obese, it alters our microbiome. And when we're overweight or obese, it causes us to... Um, shift our our bacteria. So if the gut is craving sugar, you've got that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or that small intestinal fungal overgrowth that's really craving sugar, now we're getting to the place where we're starting to gain weight. And yes, it's a protective factor for osteoporosis, but it also is very, very toxic to all of our body systems. And so it's not the direction that we want to be going. People who have gastrointestinal disease tend to have osteopenia independent of the effects of all of the nutrition that we have. And so, you know, why on earth does this, does this happen? Well, there's a ton of research that shows that the gut microbiome is very important for both bone metabolism as well as the absorption of the bone-related minerals and vitamins that we just mentioned. And so we need that gut microbiome to be a really diverse community that is able to do all of this absorption. Now, osteoblasts that help to build the bone and then osteoclasts that break down the bones are also governed by our gut microbiome. The gut microbiome has an influence over the activity of our osteoclasts. And if we have germ-free mice, we have fewer, um, we have fewer and fewer osteoclasts, but we don't need fewer and fewer osteoclasts. We need this balance, this delicate interaction between the bone building and the bone breaking down. Another really important thing is short chain fatty acids. So these short chain fatty acids are some of the postbiotics. Postbiotics are what the body generates when we have good prebiotics as well as probiotics. So the probiotics eat the prebiotics and they generate postbiotics. One of the most important postbiotics are called short chain fatty acids, things like butyrate, acetate, and propionate. And these are the main 
byproducts of bacterial fermentation, especially in the large intestine. And these short chain fatty acids are what really help to increase calcium absorption because they reduce the pH of the intestine. And so this is able to get absorbed just in its pure form instead of in salt forms. And so short chain fatty acids are very, very, very important to the absorption of, of calcium. So we see the gut microbiome having an impact primarily on our osteoclast metabolic activity, as well as being a, just hugely, hugely important for the absorption of the nutrients. I love that you brought up short chain fatty acids and postbiotics, super, super important. Uh, you know, I know those studies that looked at feeding mice short chain fatty acids and a high fiber diet. Uh, that can markedly increase bone mass, prevent bone loss, significantly improve osteoporosis in those mice studies, which is awesome. Um, and, you know, you specifically brought up, brought up um, butyrate, uh, which is a really important one, propionate. Um, yeah. So what are, let's say they're not consuming a high fiber diet. How else would we get these postbiotics? Like, let's say we have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and, you know, some other things, but we still want to get these postbiotics. There, there are a few um, supplements out there that contain postbiotics. They are becoming more uh, frequent, but ultimately they are kind of more difficult to find. Um, but if we think about... If we think about our, our postbiotics, you know, we can think about how these, these are non-living things. And so they, they are able to get into, into our, into our supplements fairly easily. It's just, they're so new. They're so, so very new that we don't see them very often, but they are becoming more common. So simply look for where you can get supplements that contain the acetates, contain the propionates, contain really the, the butyrates as well. Um, and they can be found, um, but they're, they're, they're not as common, but you can also look for not only short chain fatty acids, but you can find supplements that have other postbiotics like your your exopolysaccharides the the cell wall fragments are fairly easy to find and then some some functional proteins as well that you can supplement into into the diet and into and into like your actual supplement routine as well i mean really and truly the best way is if you can't eat the prebiotic fibers at least eat the probiotics you know eat the fermented foods mm -hmm. and take the postbiotic supplements when you can get your hands on them you can we're seeing an uptick in some of the heat killed probiotics which are also considered postbiotics so it's becoming more common but really and truly the best way to get this is for your body to generate them on your own so just because a probiotic is not living doesn't mean all of its uh, positive effects are potentially gone Oh, correct. Yeah, absolutely. We know that there are some heat killed probiotics that can specifically shred belly fat that can really help with abdominal fat. And so, yeah, just because you've heat killed a probiotic doesn't mean that it's like, you know, it doesn't mean that it's worthless. It's sure. just different. It's just sure. different. And then also uh, there is butter and ghee. So if you can't do, you know, butter and you're on maybe a paleo AIP or paleo or something like that, you can incorporate ghee and that can also be a source of butyrate, which could be right. really, really helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, so a couple other things here. Uh, I know you, you also want to touch on, let, let's touch on uh, the six types of exercise that can improve bone health. What are, uh, sure. let's walk through those. So, I mean, I, like I said, I'm sure pe people have talked about load bearing exercises and how important they are. Balance exercises are very important. Um, but, you know, there, there are, there are six total types of exercise. So there's cardiovascular, which is great for the cardiovascular system, helping to evacuate all that calcium, making it free so that it can go into the bones. Strength exercises cannot be overemphasized in the, in the prevention of, of osteopenia and osteoporosis. Balance exercises, especially if 
if osteopenia or osteoporosis exists. But the things that I really want you to think about are the the mind body connection, um, because the greater the stress is in your life the worse off your life is going to be, right? There's no disease that stress doesn't make worse. And remember, as it relates to bone health, remember your hierarchy of hormones, right? So estrogen and testosterone, which greatly impact bone health, are at the top. But then underlying that is probably a thyroid problem. And then underlying that is either an insulin or a cortisol problem. So that cortisol may be a root cause of what's causing your your estrogen levels to be off, which can cause major impacts on, on your, on your bone health. So don't underestimate that mind body, the meditation, the yoga, the coordination of movement with breath, et cetera. The next one is activities of daily living. Just can you move around more throughout your day? Can you challenge yourself to, you know, just jump up and down a little bit or like I'm doing, you know, sitting on a bouncy ball as I'm, as I'm teaching, just challenge yourself to move more all throughout your day. And then the last one that I'll mention that I think is so important, not only for, for bone health, but overall mobility, especially as we age is stretching is also a very, very important thing. So, you know, don't get so far down the rabbit hole of strength training, strength training, be sure that you're doing all six forms of exercise. That's great. That's great. And then, um, can you talk about maybe if, if you were to be composing a grocery basket of, you know, things that you would want to see in a bone health plan, what would you incorporate in that? Um, I mean, I think one of the biggest things, you know, I heard a dietitian one time say food is nothing more than a vehicle to get more extra virgin olive oil. And so when I think of food in general, just extra virgin olive oil is always at the top of the list. We know that people who follow a Mediterranean diet where they're having at least 50 milliliters of olive oil a day, they show greater markers of bone formation than people who don't um, eat, get all of that extra virgin olive oil. We also think that we, we also know that olive oil can help to increase bone mineral density. So that's a great one as well. Um, cranberries are another one. Um, so cranberries contain a polyphenol. Polyphenols are all the colors that we have in our food. And the red color, one of the red colors is proanthocyanidins. Um, and these can help to decrease bone breakdown. And so people who tend to eat more cranberries tend to have higher bone mass. Um, cranberries also contain vitamin C, which is needed to create the collagen that's in the bone matrix as well. Um, avocado provides that boron that we mentioned earlier that can help with the absorption of magnesium and vitamin D, all of the things. And, um, shiitake mushrooms contain huge amounts of vitamin D. They're also just completely completely delicious. And they contain a trace mineral copper. And if our copper levels are too low, then we have decreased bone mineral density. Um, and then last but not least, I would think about prunes, which are kind of legendary for their support of the gut, but they also contain phenols that have a positive role in our bone health and our bone mineral density, et cetera. And so, and I think it bears saying like, look, friends, if you take nothing else out of your diet, if you are still drinking dark cola, you are basically robbing your bones. You are saying you are doing the opposite of what a bisphosphonate does, right? So a bisphosphonate, remember we have our biphosphate groups, our two phosphate groups that stick to the top of the bone. Soda contains phosphoric acid, and that's one of the things that gives it its color. And that is literally being like, hi, calcium, come into the gut. And it is pulling calcium directly out of your bones, directly out of your teeth. So get off of the dark colored sodas. Um, and if you're still drinking conventional sodas, just allow me to give you permission to stop. Um, and avoid foods really high in sodium, um, excessive alcohol, you know, even certain, certain like really dark black teas can have a lot of phosphorus in them. And, 
And, you know, Kevin, I would be super interested. What is your take on oxalates? Because it is all over the map. Some people say oxalates are the devil. Some people say oxalates are, you know, not really of harm. But there is definitely controversy as it relates to not only bone health, but kidney health as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if somebody already has issues with like they've got kidney stones or they've got a lot of joint pain that's unexplainable or like a bunch of other issues like that. Um, you may have a hard time breaking down and degrading oxalate, right? You may be lacking oxalobacter formagenes. You may be lacking some of the other uh, bacteria that you need to actually break down and degrade oxalate. Or you could have, you know, a yeast overgrowth and you could be uh, producing oxalate. So th there are a lot of different things that could be playing an, an issue there. But um, typically, if somebody has issues with their bone health, consuming large amounts of oxalate is probably not something that like if you've got high oxalate foods in your diet consistently i would probably figure out how we can make swaps for that like if your lunchtime salad is spinach every day let's swap that out for some arugula uh and and maybe some other some other ones well and that's such just you know i think that that's quintessential advice that anybody who is on a health journey could hear, you know, whether or not it's about bones, like the, the greater diversity in the plants that you eat on a weekly basis, the healthier you are, you know, I mean, if I give people challenges, can you eat 25 different fruits and vegetables? Can you eat 30? Um, one, one of my friends that's really an overachiever, she did a hundred one week where, you know, you, and you, and you do have to manipulate the system a little bit to where you're like, I'm eating one almond, one walnut, one pistachio, one, you know, whatever. But I think it's valid. I think it's so valid because that is how we get all of those different all of those different phenols and proanthocyanins and all of the phytonutrients that come inside of plants. And so, yeah, it's, it's just not good health advice in general to eat spinach every single day, but you know, spinach and then romaine and then arugula and then kale and then lacinato kale and then some butterleaf lettuce and then some endive and just make it a smorgasbord people. Yes, diversity. And a lot of times people are stuck in their routines. Like they're just, mm -hmm. they're comfortable. We're familiar. I've done this every day for 40 years or 30 years or 20 years. Switch it up. It's okay to do that because um, yeah. you're going to get a different nutrient profile with those meals. So I'm glad you brought mm -hmm. that up too. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of, I'd love to know for you, what are your thoughts? What are your feelings about dairy? Are they, is that really necessary for your bones? Okay. I have a real big soapbox about this. Um, Go for it. no, I think that dairy has been so far overestimated as a, a source of health and wellness. I mean, we know how inflammatory conventional dairy can be. And I mean, you know, guys don't, don't, don't come after me. If you're happy drinking your grass fed raw dairy that you get from the far, like, fine, you're not hurting my feelings. But when it comes to conventional dairy, one of the biggest problems that I have with it is you have unopposed calcium, right? And so when I think of what is opposed versus unopposed calcium, Unopposed calcium is when it's like here, calcium. All right. So that's what you're getting from, from dairy. But what nature really has given us, because I mean, guys, we were not really intended to be eating cow's milk because what is cow's milk intended to do? It's intended to make a baby calf as fat as possible so that it can grow as fat as fast as possible. And so that's literally what it's doing to us too, is causing us to be as fat as possible so that we can grow. But the problem is, is we're, we're all adults. We're all at our terminal heights. Right. Um, and so when I think about plants as a source of calcium, all plants contain chlorophyll, whether or not they are green, they all contain chlorophyll. Well, chlorophyll is like this big it's this huge molecule and sitting at the center of every chlorophyll molecule is a magnesium ion. 
And so now we're getting calcium, but we're also getting magnesium in every single dose. And so when you have unopposed calcium, that is where we run the risk of not having magnesium, vitamin K2, vitamin D, um, and all of the other cofactors that go into the absorption of calcium. Well, that means that you have a lot of calcium floating around in your blood. And because calcium homeostasis is so critical for muscle contraction, your heart doesn't like it when there's too much calcium hanging out in the blood because it throws off its ionic potential, which is potentially deadly. And this is one of the reasons that bisphosphonate drugs can cause atrial fibrillation is because it's interfering with our calcium homeostasis. And so what happens then is is that the calcium sinks up with fat in your blood and begins to create atherosclerotic plaques, which burrow into the wall, the walls of your arteries, causing major problems. And oftentimes when we have those atherosclerotic plaques, one of the main ways that we get strokes is because a piece of it will break off. A hardened piece, a calcified piece of fat will break off, travel to the brain, causes a stroke, and then we have major, major issues. And so I am not a huge fan of using dairy as a as the primary source of, of calcium because it is inflammatory. It breaks down your gut barrier. It leads to leaky gut. Introduction of cow's milk before the age of one has been associated with all types of allergenic type diseases like asthma, eczema, um, seasonal rhinitis, as well as um, the onset of autism has been linked to really early onset of introduction of cow's milk. We also know that our bodies are trying to help us get smarter. There used to really not be any such thing as a lactose intolerance, but our microbiome, when we expose our microbiome to stuff that it doesn't like, it causes the body to shift. And in this situation, it's caused the body to shift away from the production of enzymes that can metabolize lactose. And so we, we, our microbiome is now producing less lactase and the body is basically saying like, please stop drinking this stuff. And so the onset of milk was an outright manipulation in the 40s when the industrialization of milk production became became a thing and it has been perpetuated over the course of years with very brilliant marketing campaigns um but i don't think it's the best source of calcium because it is unopposed and i won't go down the rabbit hole but there certainly are also animal abuse issues that need to be considered as well when it comes to getting calcium as a primary or sorry, getting calcium primarily from, from dairy. And so, and the other thing is it's so easy to fortify foods. Like you can take some oat milk, some hemp milk, some whatever. It's just so easy to fortify foods with calcium and vitamin D. Um, you know, some of the, some of the, things I read online were saying, you know, what's your best source of calcium and vitamin D? And it's like fortified foods, which I tend to disagree with, but the point is valid. Sure. Sure. And yeah, like there's, there's no denying there's plenty of calcium in dairy. Uh, no denying that it is a bioavailable right. source of calcium. Um, but if someone is adding or incorporating dairy to their plan, uh, you know, number one, I don't agree with drink a bunch of milk. Like that's, uh, or I'm not a big fan of that. But um, in terms of incorporating any kind of dairy, cultured and fermented dairy would be the way to go, right? That way you've got um, additional benefits from probiotics or from beneficial bacteria and yeast and um, the, the nutrients are going to be better absorbed. Um, and Again, that's only if it works for your plan. That's not for everybody. Yeah, and I, I also think it bears mentioning, you know, dairy, I hear people say like, I'm addicted to cheese. That's not false. You're not just saying those words. You are 
literally addicted to dairy because dairy contains ingredients called caseomorphins. And caseomorphins are a group of, so case, KCO stands for casein that is inside milk, which is kind of like a binding protein. It's found in, oh my gosh, so many processed foods. But caseomorphins are are molecules inside of milk, inside of cheeses that bind the morphine receptor in your brain. And so they they are very literally addictive. It's not just a colloquialism that we think that we have a physical addiction to to dairy. We we literally do have this um dopaminergic pathway that gets triggered every single time that we that we consume dairy. Wow. Well, this has been a, this has been an amazing chat. I'm so glad we had the opportunity to do this. Now, I, I do want to talk about. Now, I know if you're listening to this uh, when this is published and launched on on either YouTube or the podcast, you're going to know that we've got an upcoming summit, Engineering the Microbiome. Dr. Lindsay is hosting this summit. So, tell us a little bit about that summit. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited about the summit because we go through how the microbiome interacts with our body on so many levels, things that I would have never considered that people came to me and pitched. So the summit is five days long. It launches September 26th through October the 2nd. It is free and online during all of those days. We start out by understanding the basics. We talk about how does our microbiome break down? And so we talk about, you know, what are the foods, the behaviors, the lifestyle patterns, the environmental toxins that are poisoning our microbiome. We talk about the microbiome and how we can use our microbiome to do things like, like improve our bone health. How do we heal SIBO using our microbiome? How do we heal heartburn? What about cancer? Because we have Dr. William Lee coming in to talking about eating to beat disease. We talk about how important oral health and the oral microbiome is, how the microbiome is responsible for saliva production, the sinus microbiome, and how critical that can be in, in preventing infections. We also talk about how the microbiome relates on some ways that I think are relatively unexpected. You know, we talk about how the microbiome influences fertility, how it influences sexual pleasure, how it influences birth, how it can be transformed early in life, in the middle of life, how it impacts menopause and andropause, and really how we can craft the microbiome in all different ways of our lives. You know, how do we craft the microbiome to help us heal autoimmune conditions, to avoid mold, to become more resilient towards Lyme? You know, if our microbiome is off, what happens with our Epstein-Barr virus? Like we talk in depth and, and we talk about the skin microbiome and what an important interface that is to the outside world. We go deep. There are more than 40 interviews um, that we have recorded, and it is going to be a fantastic, fantastic event. If you're interested in learning more about the microbiome, I, I invite you to come and join us. I promise you will walk away with some big aha moments to take you from feeling stuck and I don't know what my next step is with my health to like, heck yeah, I know how important my microbiome is and here is how I'm going to work on it. Awesome. I'll be there too. I'm going to link to this in the show notes. Uh, it's September 26th through October 2nd, 2022. And if you're watching this after or beyond, that's okay. Uh, don't worry about it because we're going to leave you uh, Dr. Lindsay's other uh, contact information below. So where can people get a hold of you beyond that, Dr. Lindsay? Absolutely. You can find me at lindsayelmore.com. I have a, um, a functional medicine website called wellnessmadesimple.us. And then I am very easy to find on social media at Lindsay Elmore on Facebook and Instagram, as well as Dr. Lindsay Elmore on Pinterest and TikTok. And you can listen to the Lindsay Elmore show anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Awesome. Love it. And for everybody listening here and watching, you can find all the resources, show notes, everything mentioned here on this episode over at bonecoach.com forward slash Dr. Lindsay Elmore. I want to thank you again, everyone, so much for your time. We'll see you in the next episode. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Hope you found that episode helpful and that you enjoyed it. Just one last reminder, if you haven't done so already, 
head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for your free seven day osteoporosis kickstart. It's going to tell you everything you need to do to start getting on the path to improvement. Hope you found this helpful. I'm your bone coach, Kevin Ellis. I'll see you soon.